mentioned that Derek Ring is a Pascal II invited speaker. And uh, we come from New York City to talk about how to recognize errors. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, for, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so I'm going to start, actually, is it possible that? Uh, so, um, so I'm going to start uh, by talking about recognition as it's usually defined within computer vision. So usually when we think about recognition, we think about assigning some image to some object category. Um, so for example, if we wanted to build a dog detector, something that can detect dogs, the way that we would do it is we would uh, gather a set of uh, training examples, a set of examples of dogs, and a set of examples of things that are not dogs. We choose some visual features, and then train a classifier that can differentiate between the dog examples and the not dog examples based on that visual representation. And so, um, and so from this, the object representation that the computer system has is that there are a few things in the world that are dogs, and there's a whole lot of things in the world that are not dogs. Then if we wanted to take this representation and, and find dogs in natural images, the way that we would do it is we'd search over different positions and scales and extract features at each window, and then for each one of these patches, the, the, our template model would say, is this a dog or is this not a dog? Is it an object or not an object? And likewise, if we wanted to be able to recognize more different kinds of objects, we would repeat the same process, just training new detectors and running them all on, on this image. And then, um, so this, this basic framework started with face detection um, around 1995, that's that sort of the, when uh, statistical template matchers started to work fairly well. And then uh, eventually people wanted to broaden this, this object recognition capacity. And the way that we broaden it in general is by making more categories. Um, so you went from funnel faces to things like cars or pedestrians, multiple views. And then there, the Pascal challenge came where you started with four object categories in 2005, then expanded to 10 object categories in 2006, then to 20 categories. And then if you look at the task of image categorization, we have some picture of an object and you want to assign it to one of K categories. We start out with something like Caltech 4, where you're trying to dif differentiate between some object like an uh, airplane and a random background image. Then to 101, 256, and finally 1000. And so the, the implication of this trend of progress is that if we could only get enough categories, then maybe we would finally have a complete recognition system. And maybe if we had the 30,000 categories that Biedermann says is the complete set of, of recognizable categories, then we would be able to recognize everything. But, the, um, but when we go about our daily tasks, we don't really do recognition that way. Most of the time, we're not searching for a particular object that we have in mind. We're not searching through collections of images or collections of visual data for objects or, or classifying into one of K categories. Instead, we have to deal with the world as it comes to us. And that's important for a lot of applications where you put a machine out into the world. So as one example, imagine if you attached one of these category-based recognition systems to an uh, automated vehicle. Um, so let's say uh, we've got some vehicle that has some detection system in it. It's got all kinds of different detectors. Detectors for cars and bicycles, motorbikes, cats, dogs, sheep. So the thing's driving down the road, running all of these detectors, and then all of a sudden this thing walks out in front of it. So it's running its, its cat and dog and sheep and bicycle and car detectors, but the designers forgot to build in a cow detector. So the thing's going down the road, and then the last thing that passes through its electronic mind before the vehicle crumples into this very large non-object is not a sheep. <laughs> so it's not, it's not a very satisfactory solution. If there were a person behind the wheel, though, even if you had never seen this thing before in your life, you would be able to respond appropriately. And in fact, it doesn't really matter if you can recognize it as a cow. What you would want to know is that it's, it's going to do major damage to the vehicle unless you hit the brakes or swerve or something. And you want to know that it's, it's uh, some, some kind of animal that, that's moving towards the left so you know how to respond appropriately. So we want, we want recognition systems that are not just searching through an image collection for some target, but that can deal with the world as the world comes to it. 
And, and it's very hard to predict what the computer is going to encounter. So, so it might not be a cow, it might be a flock of sheep, or a pride of lions, or a bunch of other man-made objects. There's a whole ton of different things that you could experience, and you just have to be able to deal with it. So as another example, imagine you have an automated security system. And so these guys burst into the store carrying katanas. You're probably not going to think to build in a katana detector into your security system. And yet hopefully you would realize that this is not a commonplace event and it's something that you should, you should sound an alarm or notify security or something. So, um, so the question that I'm interested in is the question of, of how we can recognize everything. And that's a different question than how do you recognize 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 categories because it requires that we think about objects in a different way, that we think about objects in a way that allows us to generalize to, to new categories, to new things that are not in our current vocabulary or training set. And so, so another way to express this is just how do we get rid of the non-object? How do we think about recognition in a way so that nothing is completely unknown, so that, so that there's no void, nothing, is, nothing causes a complete failure of the recognition system? So, um, so one of the key challenges is one, of, is one of representation. The question is, how does a new object relate to known objects? So this is sort of the, the semantic problem. How do you create the relations between the different objects that you've observed and between the objects that you've observed and, uh, and new kinds of objects? What kind of relations do you have? So the, the categorization way of doing this is that you would sort these different images into different categories. So you'd have like cats and dogs and horses and so on. And that tells you something if you see a cat or dog or a horse. At least you know it's similar to these other, uh, these other objects. And if you have some information attached to the categories, then you can say something about those objects. But if you get some new object that doesn't fit into those categories, then you're at a complete loss. So from my view, like this categorization is kind of a, a lossy quantization of a continuous space of natural objects. And the big problem is that if you have a limited number of categories, then you have some complete holes in that representation. There's gaps where you just have no ability to deal with those objects at all. So another challenge which is relating, but re related but just framed in a more machine learning uh, uh, view is how do we learn about many related objects? So intuitively, if, if we're trying to learn about cows and we already know a lot about horses and dogs, it should be a lot easier. And, um, but the key question is, what do we share among these different kinds of object categories? What is it that a dog has in, uh, in common with a cow that should allow us to more easily learn about cows given our knowledge of dogs? And for this, I think the, the key is really to think about the shared representation not so much the transferred learning or multitask uh, view, which, which sort of implies that, that the answer is in the regularization. The key is figuring out the right way to connect these different kinds of objects. So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of our efforts in this, in this area, and I would say that these are more of an exploration and attempt to understand the problem than a final solution. Um, and then I'm going to talk about just a couple of uh, what I see as open challenges. So the first is, is, is that attribute-based representation, where we want to try to describe an object in terms of its properties, instead of just categorizing it. And I'll motivate that with just one more example. So imagine that you're on vacation somewhere, you've uh, eaten a burrito, you crumple up the wrapper, you want to go throw it out. So you walk over to a garbage can, and then this thing scuttles out. So my guess is that most of us probably wouldn't identify this very precisely, at least not immediately, and yet, most of us would probably not proceed to go and take off the lid of a garbage can and, and throw out the wrapper. Um, the reason is because we, even though even if we have no idea what it is, we can tell that it's not something that we, that we want to put our hand near. It's got a huge claw, it's got a hard body, it looks really scary. And so, so this motivated the attributes work in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that it's really important to deal with the unfamiliar objects. So even if you can't identify it, you still want to respond to it. You don't want to just ignore its presence. It's not just somebody else's problem. You have, to, uh, you have to know something about it. And also, often what we care about is not so much the category, but the properties of the object. And so the idea of the attributes is just to try to predict those properties directly. It's a very um, straightforward and simple uh, idea. So, um, so, we, so we did that, so the, so the idea is that we're going to describe these different kinds of objects according to their shape and parts and materials, 
And we're going to try to learn uh, to predict those properties in a way that will generalize new kinds of objects. So for example, this, uh, this airplane is described as having the shape of a horizontal cylinder. It has a wing propeller, window wheel. It's made of metal and glass. <coughs> the car has a window wheel, door, headlight, side mirror, and it's made of metal and it's shiny. So there's these different uh, properties that describe the objects, and some of the properties are shared among objects in different categories. So this allows you to relate something new uh, to something that you've seen before. So the, the learning problem that we have now is that we have a set of these object images that are annotated with these binary attributes. So something um, has a, a shape of a horizontal cylinder, or it doesn't. Uh, something's made of metal, or it's not. Um, and, and for these part descriptions, they're, they're indicating the parts that you can actually see. So we're not necessarily trying to infer what's invisible here, just what's, what's visibly present. Um, and then we want to learn some model that will allow, allow us to take some new image, like this one, and predict the attributes for that object. So we would want to say that this thing has a horn, and, and a head, and an eye, and so on, and that's furry. So to be able to provide some description of these, these uh, novel objects. So the first thing that we tried is uh, just the most straightforward classification uh, task. Um, so we, we take all the positive, for each attribute separately, we take all the positive examples of things that have that attribute, all the negative examples of things that don't have the attribute, uh, create some uh, standard features, color, texture, histogram, gradient, candy edges, and then train a classifier that differentiates between the objects that has that, have the attribute and the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. Now, this has, this has a problem, actually. Uh, the problem is that a lot of these attributes are strongly correlated through the training categories. So if we take the has wheel attribute, for example, and we learn it from bicycles and, and airplanes and cars and animals, say, which don't have wheels, then there's no way for the system to figure out what a wheel actually is. It's going to correlate. Instead of learning just has wheel, it might learn uh, features that have to do with made of metal, or other things that these categories have that most of the other categories that don't have wheels don't have. So there's this problem of correlation through the categories. And then this, this causes a severe problem when you try to make predictions for new objects, because if you see something else that doesn't have a lot of these same properties of the categories that you learn from, but still has this attribute, has wheel, then it's going to uh, incorrectly uh, assign the attribute. So, um, so the way that we dealt with this is by, uh, instead of just learning uh, a, a classifier to differentiate between all things that have the attribute and things that don't, we train classifiers that differentiate within each category. So for has wheel, we would say train uh, select features that can differentiate between airplanes where you can see the wheel and airplanes where you can't see the wheel, or cars where you can see the wheel and cars where you can't see the wheel and then pull those features together and use only those features to, uh, to classify a particular attribute. And so that leads to much more robust prediction of attributes um, without getting tangled up as much in the, the correlations within the, the training categories. So, um, so for this approach, our, our experiment, our setup is that we, we train about 60 attribute classifiers describing the parts, the shape, material, on uh, 20 object classes, and then we want to test to see how well we can predict, predict those attributes for those same classes, the familiar objects, um, but more interestingly, to see if, how well we can predict those attributes for new kinds of categories that aren't seen during training. And those new categories are, are images of objects that were downloaded through a different process, and, uh, and they're different categories. And then there's a, there's a bunch of questions. Uh, so then we want to see what kind of uh, abilities this uh, attribute-based representation gives us. So this here is showing some examples of the attribute predictions for objects from novel categories. It's never, during training, it didn't see any buildings or carriages or zebras. Um, but it saw things that have some attributes in common. So, um, so it thinks that this building is a, has a 3D boxy shape. It also thinks it has a vertical cylindrical shape. Uh, has parts, window, row of windows, thinks it has a headlight, sees this carriage and it thinks it has a kind of a 3D boxy shape and also a rounded shape, that it has a window, a wheel, and a torso, um, sees this, this zebra and it, and it says it has a tail, a snout, a legs, it also thinks it has text, which is probably because it's black and white, and it thinks it's made of plastic, which is probably because it's just kind of shiny. <laughs> 
So, so it's certainly not a perfect description of these objects, but it's able to provide some description where with a, with a purely category-based view, you'd be able to say nothing, or you'd be able to say something wrong. And so just quantitatively, uh, we looked at, the, at how well we can predict these attributes on average and uh, for different kinds of attributes and how it compares for the familiar objects, which are the categories used for training, and the unfamiliar objects. And um, so chance here would be about 0.5, so we're able to predict the attributes much better than chance. Parts are easier than materials and shape. And there's some drop off, as you would expect, going from the familiar objects to the unfamiliar objects. Um, but it's still, uh, it's still well above chance. The drop off is not, is not that great. So another thing we are interested in is we can uh, tell what's unusual about some object. So we can learn from the training set what attributes you would expect from a particular category, and then try to see in testing if we detect some attribute that was unexpected given the category label. Um, so these are, these are some examples. It says the computer says that this is a sheep that doesn't have any wool. This is a boat that doesn't have any sail. Uh, this is a sofa that has a wheel. This is a bike that has a horn. So some of them are not actually, some of them are correct, like these examples. Some of them are not actually correct, but they still tell you something additional about what it's seeing. So this sofa, of course, doesn't have a wheel, but its pillows kind of look wheel-like. This bike doesn't have a horn, but it has a kind of horn-shaped ha handlebar. So they're telling you some, so this description is telling you something about the visual properties of those objects. <coughs> um, and then we're also interested in whether we could recognize things based on a description. Um, so in this case, in the, this is a qualitative example in the top here. So this is the query. It's the, somebody's trying to give a description of a monkey, something that has an arm, has face, foot, it's furry, has a bunch of other parts. And then these are, uh, these are the top retrieved examples uh, broken down into the true positives and false positives. And uh, so in this, <clears throat> in this case, the data set just has 12 different categories. Monkeys are one of the categories. Um, and then you can see, so there's, so it finds a bunch of monkeys. The false positives, though, also mostly fit that description. There's a kid next to a donkey, like a monkey-looking statue, uh, a couple of centaurs, which, which also sort of fit, fit the description. Um, so, so it's able to, uh, it's able to at least like find some things that, that fit that description. And then this is just showing that uh, the feature selection that I talked about, where you try to, to um, decorrelate within the categories, makes a big difference for this kind of task. And it also makes a really big difference for predicting the unusual properties of objects. So uh, chance here would be 8%. Uh, there's 12 different categories. Uh, without the feature selection, it's about 25%. And with it, it's about 33% accuracy in terms of um, the top retrieved images. So, um, so from this work, a couple of conclusions is that mainly the, the attribute prediction gives us uh, more flexible recognition systems. It gives us the ability to deal with unfamiliar objects to some extent. It gives us the ability to provide more information about the familiar objects and to potentially learn from description. And I want to mention that there's a lot of other related works and attributes, some of which was, uh, happened at the same time and some of which was subsequent. Um, one thing to highlight is that there's some recent work by Parkey and Grauman where they, uh, instead of just dealing with binary attributes, they uh, describe objects in terms of relative attributes. Like a tennis ball is more furry than a baseball, but less furry than a cat. And these relative attributes lead to much more accurate descriptions they show, and they also lead to better uh, zero-shot learning. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in this, in this domain. So, for our own part, like one of the things that we were uh, that we weren't too satisfied with is that we're just labeling everything at the image level. We have these binary attributes at the image level. We're not taking into account the correlational structures among the different attributes or the interesting spatial relations for things like parts and, and shape and so on. The other thing is that um, with the work that I just presented, you're given some picture of an object and you're trying to assign the attributes to that picture of the object. Um, but in, in natural images, you first need to be able to find the object. Unless you can find the object, you can't really assign any attributes to it. And so the next thing that I'll tell you about tries to deal with those two problems. We try to learn shared models of the appearance and spatial layouts of, of, part, of uh, objects so that we can find and describe 
novel objects in, um, in images. So, um, so when we started to work on this, we realized that there was kind of, uh, that we needed to collect some new data to address this problem. Most of the data and recognition has been focused on a categorization task. And, uh, and in part, we, fe we felt like with the attributes work, um, having just these image level uh, labels made it really hard to learn the correct meanings of the attributes, to correctly map between the, the visual features and the, true, uh, and, and, and the true labels in a robust way. And so we decided just to provide a lot of annotation. Um, so we created this data set where we have uh, a whole bunch of animals and vehicles and we have segmentations for the objects and for the parts and category labels and a bunch of different attribute labels that describe the pose and context and other properties of, of these particular objects. And, um, and this data set is available online and we're, we're continually growing it. So right now the, the version that's available has, uh, has a lot of animals and vehicles, but we're also collecting furniture and hand tools and all kinds of other objects. So the task for this data set is that you get to see some of these object categories during training, but then there's other object categories that you'll only see during testing. So you'll see something, some, some, uh, so you'll, you'll get to learn about some animals and vehicles on the training set, and then in testing, you'll experience all the different animals and vehicles that are in the data set, and you need to make predictions about all of them. So the, the, problem, uh, the problem set up here is that we have some training data where we have pictures of objects, and we have uh, like bounding boxes um, or, or segmentations of the object locations and the part locations, and then there's some categorical <coughs> attributes that describe the pose and other, um, and other properties. And then the goal is if we take an input image like this, um, that we'll have some model that will be able to describe the objects within the known domains, which in this case are the, the animals and the vehicles. And if it's some object that was seen, if it's a particular category that's seen during training, like cars in the training set, then we'd want to know that it's a car. But if it's something that's not in the training set, like cows are not in the training set, then it's not going to be able to say that it's a cow, but we want it to know that it's some kind of four-legged animal and find the parts and predict that it's walking towards the left, which would be useful information um, for taking action. And uh, so, so the way that our representation is organized in this case is that we have uh, groups of categories that we say are related, like animals. And the idea is that within these related groups of categories, it's meaningful to share attributes, to share parts, actions, and other things within those objects. But you're not, for example, going to benefit much from uh, your knowledge of tables if you're trying to learn about cows. So across, across these domains, there's, there's no interaction in the learning. Um, so in this case, our, our representation of the objects is we have some set of detectors for uh, basic categories like uh, elk or, or pet or dog. For broad categories like four-legged animal or water animal or, uh, or a land vehicle. And uh, in parts, like for animals, the leg, torso, and head. So um, these broader categories, like four -leg broader detectors, like four-legged animal, are supposed to are trained to be able to detect any of the four-legged animals in the data set. The parts are trained to be able to detect the heads or legs of, of any animal that's in the training set. And then the uh, the basic detectors are supposed to be more tuned towards that particular object category. So, um, so we learn these detectors, and then we also learn spatial models that are shared among the different kinds of objects um, to encode the relative positions of the objects and their parts. So in this representation, we have, we have shared representations within a domain like animal or vehicle, and in particular, we're sharing the appearance models for the parts in the broad categories and sharing the spatial layout models. So the idea is that if you have like a, a dog facing the right and a cow facing the right, you can share quite a lot among the, the appearance models of their parts and their spatial layouts. So the, the initial approach we took is just to train separate detectors. We train a separate leg and head and, and uh, four-legged animal detector. And then we, want, we uh, run those detectors over the images. Uh, we also train a spatial model that allows those detectors to predict the whole object location. So, so in this case, we get a bunch of detections. Uh, this is simplified, so there'd really be a lot, of, a lot of potential detections at this point. But we get a bunch of detections for possible locations of the part and parts and objects. And then these vote on the location of the, of the objects as a whole. <coughs> 
So it would say, I think there's some animal here. And then given the different part detections and their locations, and given the object detections, all these different detections vote on what the attributes of this particular object uh, are, <coughs> is. No, are. So, um, so, it'll, so we want to say that this is a dog, four-legged like animal, it has a nose, uh, predict the parts, say that it's lying down, facing the camera, and it can jump, and so on. So, um, so this is, uh, so, so that's actually a pretty simple approach, but, um, but it provides much more detailed descriptive ability to the recognition system. So the animal did get to see elephants during training, so it can identify some of these as elephants. This is, these solid boxes are the object locations. Um, the text that it puts here are indicating what detectors made it think that there was some animal here. So it, it can find the trunk, the legs, some of the parts of these objects. And then it predicts the attributes. It's just shown for this elephant on the left. Um, so it can predict that this is something that can run and is herbivorous and is facing towards the camera. And that's based on a combination of the part layout that's detected and the detected categories. Um, but more importantly, it can, also make, uh, it can also then say something about unfamiliar objects. So the computer didn't see any carriages or horses in training, and, but it's able to say a lot about them. So it can find this uh, carriage, it doesn't know what a carriage is, but it can say it's some kind of vehicle and multiplies the wheel and say that it's something that moves on the road. It uh, doesn't know what a horse is, but it says it's some kind of four-legged ant, four-legged mammal. Um, it's got a head, it's got, uh, it finds the head, it finds the leg, and it predicts that it's something that can run and jump and that it's facing the right. So it's able to provide a lot of descriptive ability despite not having this, these particular categories within its representation. <coughs> and then just quantitatively, we, we, we show that these having these shared models where you learn about the parts and the broad categories uh, and you learn across these different um, across these different object categories in training leads to better detection performance, um, and it also leads to better prediction of the attributes. So I guess I should explain this. So this is uh, this is if you just train uh, basic category detectors, and you pull those basic category detectors like dog and sheep and whatever are seen during training, in order to try to detect all the animals in your data set. This is for the familiar objects, and this is for the unfamiliar objects, and, and this is for vehicles. So for both familiar and unfamiliar objects, learning these more um, detailed representations helps if you're just trying to detect the objects. And it also helps if you're trying to predict the attributes. So the, the green, green bars are if you just try to infer the attributes from detected basic categories, and the red bars are if you try to infer it from all of the different part and category detections. And uh, especially with pose, as you would expect, the things like detecting the parts are quite important. You can't really infer the pose from, from a category level detection. So one, one uh, downside of this approach so far is that we just independently train these different detectors. And one problem with that is that a lot of things are difficult to detect in isolation, like a lot of the parts. Um, this is showing, for example, that in order to correctly detect the head here, which is the fifth most confident detection in the image, you have to get a whole bunch of false positives on other things that mainly look kind of round, like different spots on the dog or its nose. And so these part detectors by themselves are very weak. And one consequence of that is that the part detectors don't play much of a role in the, uh, in the, in the task of localizing the objects. It's mainly the whole body object detectors, which are more reliable, which help you, which provide some context for the parts. So the idea, though, is that um, is that if we train, if we jointly train the different appearance detectors and the spatial models, then we can then when, during the learning process we can take advantage of the context provided by the other detectors. So if you're trying to learn to recognize heads or legs, it's actually a pretty bad idea just to try to differentiate between heads and legs in all different patches in any image. Um, because there's lots of different leg-like structures and images, like, uh, like branches in a tree might look like a leg, but they're not around other things that, that look like an animal. Um, so, so when we learn these detectors, we want to learn them all, learn the detectors that work well in the context of, of the other detectors. And then we also are jointly learning a spatial model uh, across all the different related objects. And we pose this as a latent structured SVM. So I don't want to go into the details of the model, but it's actually, 
turns out to be a, a fairly complicated um, thing to optimize. So, um, oh yeah, so, so uh, just one more thing about the model. So the, way, so the way that the model works is that we, we provide a set of, of objects from different categories with the locations of the parts, and then we represent the spatial model as a mixture of different spatial layouts. So you might have one spatial layout that sort of represents the side view of standing animals, another one that represents animals that are lying down and facing the camera. They don't have these labels attached to them, but they're based on, cluster, on, uh, they're based on uh, clustering and then optimizing the layouts with the, with the learning of the appearance parameters. And then each of the appearance models also has a mixture, is a mixture model. So you might end up, if different animals might have sort of different looking parts, or as you change the pose of the animal or the object, the, the appearance of the part can change. And so, so there's a mixture of appearance models, a mixture of spatial layout models, and then all of these are trained jointly. Um, so I'll show you a couple of results from this. This is showing um, just one component of the learned spatial model. So this is a, this is a model of a, a spatial layout of an animal facing the left. The, and then these are a couple of the detections. So the yellow circles are head, blue circles are torso, and the red lines indicate the positions of detected legs. And so, so the elk were in the training, there were other elk in the training set, um, so it was able to correctly localize the parts of the elk and detect it. And uh, the cows were not in the training set, and yet it's still able to localize the head and the torso and predict some of the leg positions. And then um, there's a couple more examples here. So these are objects, categories that are seen during training, so it's able to predict their more precise category labels. And, um, and in most cases, localize their parts fairly well, although there are some mistakes. Um, and then uh, these are examples of objects that are not seen during the training process. They're not, it doesn't see any cows or cats, but it can uh, detect this cat that's sort of lying down and facing the right, and it can, um, it can localize the head, this yellow circle, and the torso. Uh, it's confused, thinks that this cow is an elephant, um, but it's still uh, still able to find the parts, and then this cow doesn't know what, it doesn't try to predict what the basic category is, it just says it's some four-legged animal, and it uh, sort of does a so-so job in localizing its parts. So, um, so one thing that we found from this LIDAR experiment is that, uh, that the joint training of the appearance and, and spatial models is actually really crucial. These blue bars are showing the results that you get if you just individually train the detectors and run them. The red is if you uh, add some spatial model on top of that. And then the green is if you jointly train everything together. And it's kind of unfortunate because it would be really nice if we could take the recognition problem and just split it into these different modules of, of, uh, of things that we want to predict and then separately train those modules and stick them together. But, uh, but you'll actually take a pretty big performance hit if you do that. So at least if, to some extent, you really need to learn all of these different um, related prediction tests together. So, um, so the last thing that I want to do is just to highlight a couple of uh, what I consider to be open and pressing challenges. And these are more geared towards um, the machine learning side of things, since um, I'm hoping, hoping there'll be some uh, people in the audience that are more savvy about uh, machine learning methods than me. So, um, so one of them, which is more of a domain uh, vision thing, is, is how do we supervise? Um, so there, we have lots of different uh, choices for this. We could just provide images for which we have surrounding metadata. We could provide images where we have some basic object annotations. We could provide images like our data set where we have like a large number of annotated parts and other attributes. Uh, my best guess is that the final solution will be that you want all of this. You basically want to be able to deal with many different kinds of supervision. And uh, so we want to be opportunistic. We really want to have recognition, we want to have learning methods and recognition systems that just take all different kinds of supervision. It could be captions with images, it could be videos that are unsupervised, it could be images from the web or, or images with some partial annotation. And we want to be able to learn from all of those different annotations so that when we're during the learning process, you're just basically trying to figure out what does this image tell me about objects? What can I use from this? But at this point, it, it's sort of like a, it's, this is sort of like a, 
uh, batch processing way of thinking about it. Like you think about, you have to think about what does the computer need to know ahead of time to learn about objects. So you need to anticipate what, what's going to be difficult. Um, that's not really a, a good long-term solution. Instead, uh, I think we need to find better ways of having a more interactive learning process, where you might provide some data with, with annotations that you hope will give a good start, but, then you, but I think we need better ways of trying to fix the mistakes instead of having to anticipate them. And I think fixing the mistakes isn't just going to involve adding more of the same kinds of labels. We need to, to uh, have ways of exposing the latent structures that are learned within the recognition tasks and having, uh, trying to have people uh, fix the underlying uh, conceptual errors that the recognition system is making. And that's a, that's a really hard problem on a, lot, on a lot of levels. It's hard to expose um, the internal representations of the system, and it's, it's, um, it's hard to then incorporate that into the learning framework. And then um, <clears throat> another thing that, uh, that um, Another thing that I think is a big need is, is to have more lightweight strategies for continu continual learning. So the recognition pro problem is really hard. It's really huge. It takes people many, many years to really be able to recognize most of the objects around us. Like if, you, um, if you're around a two-year-old, the two-year-old will point to all kinds of things and give their own names for many of them. They'll, say, they'll point to a deer and say dog, or they'll point to luggage and say vroom vroom because it think it's a car. Um, so there's, there's, there's a huge number of prediction tests, so we really need very flexible machine learning frameworks that can continually build on what it already knows. And we need good representations that, that enable that kind of learning. Okay, so, so to conclude, um, the problem of recognizing everything, I think, is not really just a simple extension of the problem of recognizing a single object category. It's not really just about recognizing more object categories. We need to think about objects in a different way, to think about, uh, to have more flexible representations of objects that, that allow us to, to relate any new object that we might experience in some way to the objects that we've seen before. And so I've talked about uh, two of our efforts in this direction. One, the direct prediction of, of attributes or properties, and the other, trying to jointly train the appearance and spatial models so that we can detect the objects and then provide some description about them. And I would really characterize these as, as us just trying to understand the problem, trying to understand what are the difficulties, what are, what are effective kinds of representations. And, um, but really, we've, we've only scratched the surface. And I think that uh, some of the major open challenges, there's, there's the basic problems of visual recognition of these different attributes. Um, but I think that as we get into these more uh, open-ended challenges, this more open-ended form of recognition, we need more and more flexible learning methods and uh, ways to learn about objects where you can take in any kind of annotation and learn about it and where you can continually build on what you already know. So uh, thank you very much.